Okay, we're starting on page 10, and this is Brave New World. Do you see that? Brave New World, page 10. So, the Morula dropped into place, the saline solution poured in, and already the bottle had passed, and it was the turn of the lab labelers. Her heredity, date of fertilization, membership of Bolkonovsky group, Details were transferred from test tube to bottle. No longer anonymous, but named. Identified, the procession marched slowly on, on through an opening in the wall, slowly on into the social pre predestination room. 88 cubic meters of card index, said Mr. Foster with relish as they entered. Containing all the relevant information, added the director, brought up to date every morning and coordinated every afternoon on the basis of which they make their calculations. So many individuals of such and such quality, said Mr. Foster, distributed in such and such quantities. The optimum decanting rate at any given moment, unforeseen wastages promptly made good. Promptly, repeated Mr. Foster. If you knew the amount of overtime I had to put in after the last Japanese earthquake, he laughed good humoredly and shook his head. The predestinators send in their figures to the fertilizers. Who gives them the embryos they ask for? And the bottles come in here to be predestined. Wait a minute. The predestinators send in their figures to the fertilizers who give them the embryos they ask for. And the bottles come in here to be predestined in detail, after which they are sent down to the embryo store where we now proceed ourselves. And opening a door, Mr. Foster led the way down a staircase into the basement. The temperature was still tropical. They descended into a thickening twilight. Two doors and a passage with a double turn ensured the cellar against any possible infiltration of the day. Embryos are like photographic film, said Mr. Foster waggishly as he pushed open the second door. They can only stand red light. And in effect the sultry darkness into which the students now followed him was visible and crimson like the darkness of closed eyes on a summer afternoon the bulging flanks of row on receding row and tier above tier of bottles glinted with innumerable rubies and among the rubies moved the dim red specters of men and women with purple eyes and all the symptoms of lupus the hum and rattle of machinery faintly stirred the air. Give them a few figures, Mr. Foster, said the director, who was tired of talking. Mr. Foster was only too happy to give them a few fi figures. 220 meters long, 200 wide, 10 high. He pointed upwards, like chickens drinking. The students lifted their eyes toward the distant ceiling. Three tiers of racks, ground floor level, first gallery, second gallery. The spidery steel work of gallery above gallery faded away in all directions into the dark. Near them, three red ghosts were busily unloading demijohns from a moving staircase. The escalator from the social predestination room. Each bottle could be placed on one of 15 racks. Each... Rack, though you couldn't see it, was a conveyor traveling at the rate of 33 and a third centimeters an hour, 267 days at 8 meters a day, 2,130 meters in all. One circuit of the cel cellar at ground level, one on the first gallery, half on the second, and one on the 267th morning, Daylight in the decanting room, independent existence, so-called. But the interval 
Mr. Foster concluded. We've managed to do a lot to them. Oh, a very great deal. His laugh was knowing and triumphant. <clears throat> That's the spirit I like, said the director once more. Let's walk around. You tell them everything, Mr. Foster. Mr. Foster duly told them. Told them of the growing embryo on its bed of peritonum. Made them taste the rich blood surrogate on which it fed. Explained why it had been had to be stimulated with placentin and thyroxin. Told them of the corpus luteum extract. Showed them the jets through which, at every twelfth meter from zero to two twenty forty, it was automatically injected. Spoke of those gradually increasing doses of pituary administered during the final ninety six meters of their course. Described the artificial maternal circulation installed in every bottle. At meter one one two, showed them the reservoir of blood surrogate the centrific centrifugal pump that kept the liquid moving over the placenta and drove it through the synthetic lung and waste product filter, referred to the embryo's troublesome tendency to anemia, to the massive doses of hog stomach extract and fetal foals liver with which, in consequence, it had to be supplied, showed them the simple mechanism by means of which, during the last two meters of Every eight, all the embryos were simultaneously shaken into familiarity with movement. Hinted at the gravity of the so-called trauma of decanting and enumerated the precautions taken to minimize by a suitable training of the bottled embryo that dangerous shock, told them of the test forceps carried out in the neighborhood of meter 200. Explain the system of labeling, a T for the males, a circle for the females, and for those who were destined to become free martins, a question mark, black on white ground. For, of course, said Mr. Foster, in the vast majority of cases, fertility is merely a nuisance. One fertile ovary in 1,200, that would really be quite sufficient for our purposes, but we want to have a good choice. And, of course, one must always have an enormous margin of safety. So we allow as many as 30% of the female embryos to develop normally. The others get a dose of male sex hormone every 24 meters for the rest of the course. Result, they are decanted as free martins, structurally quite normal, except he had to admit that they do have the slightest tendency to grow beards, but sterile, guaranteed sterile. Which brings us at last, continued Mr. Foster, out of the realm of mere slavish Im imitation of nature into the much more interesting world of human invention. He rubbed his hands. He rubbed his hands, for of course they didn't content themselves with merely hatching out embryos. Any cow could do that. We also predestine and condition. We decant our babies as socialized human beings, as alphas or epsilons, as future sewage workers or future, he was going to say future world controllers, but correcting himself said future directors of hatcheries instead. The DHC acknowledged the compliment with a smile. They were passing meter 320, on rack 11, a young beta minus mechanic was busy with a screwdriver and spanner on the blood surrogate pump of a passing bottle. The hum of the electric motor deepened by fractions of a tone as he turned the nuts down, down, a final twist, a glance at the revolution counter, and he was done. He moved two paces down the line and began the same process on the next pump. Reducing the number of revolutions per minute, Mr. Foster explained. The surrogate goes round slower, therefore passes through the lung at longer intervals, therefore gives the embryo less oxygen. Nothing like oxygen shortage for keeping an embryo below par. Again, he rubbed his hands. But why do you want to keep the embryo below par? Asked an ingenious student. Ass, 
said the director, breaking a long silence. Hasn't it occurred to you that an Epsilon embryo must have an Epsilon environment as well as an Epsilon heredity? It evidently hadn't occurred to him. He was covered with confusion. The lower the cast, said Mr. Foster, the shorter the oxygen. The first organ affected was the brain. After that, the skeleton. At 70% normal oxygen, you got dwarfs. At less than 70, eyeless monsters. Who are no use at all, concluded Mr. Foster. Whereas, his voice became confidential and eager. If they could discover a technique for shortening the period of maturation, what a triumph, what a benefaction to society. Consider the horse. They considered it. Mature at six, the elephant at ten, while at thirteen a man is not yet sexually mature and is only full grown at twenty. Hence, of course, that fruit of delayed development, the human intelligence. But in Epsilons, said Mr. Foster very justly, we don't need human intelligence. Didn't need and didn't get it. But through the Epsilon mind was mature, but though the Epsilon mind was mature at 10, the Epsilon body was not fit to work till 18. Long years of superfluous and wasted immaturity if the physical development could be speeded up till it was as quick, say, as a cow's, what enormous savings to the community. Enormous, murmured the students. Mr. Foster's enthusiasm was infectious. He became rather technical, spoke of abnormal endocrine coordination, which made men grow so slowly, postulated a germinal mutation to account for it, could the effects of this germinal mutation be undone? Could the individual epsilon embryo be made a revert by a suitable technique to the normal normality of dogs and cows? That was the problem, and it was all but solved. Pilkington at Mombasa had produced individuals who were sexually mature at four and full grown at six and a half. A scientific triumph, but socially useless. Six-year-old men and women were too stupid to do even Epsilon work, and the process was an all-or-nothing one. Either you failed to modify it all, or else you modified the whole way. There, they were still trying to find the ideal compromise between adults of 20 and adults of 6. So far, without success, Mr. Foster sighed and shook his head. Are on page 16. Their wanderings through the crimson twilight had brought them to the neighborhood of Meter 170 on Rack 9. From this point onwards, Rack 9 was enclosed, and the bottles performed the remainder of their journey into a, in a kind of tunnel, interrupted here and there by openings of two and, or three meters wide. Heat conditioning, said Mr. Foster. Hot tunnels alternated with cool tunnels. Coolness was wedded to discomfort in the form of hard x-rays. By the time they were decanted, the embryos had a horror of cold. They were predestined to emigrate to the tropics to be miners and ex acetate silk spinners and steel workers. Later, on their minds, would be made to endorse the judgment of their bodies. We conditioned them to thrive on heat, concluded Mr. Foster. All colleagues upstairs will teach them to love it. And that, put in the director sententiously, that is the secret of happiness and virtue, liking what you've got to do. All conditioning aims at that, making people like their unescapable social destiny. In a gap between two tunnels, a nurse was delicately probing with a long, fine syringe into the gelatinous contents of a passing bottle. The students and their guides stood watching her for a few moments in silence. Well, Lenina, said Mr. Foster, when at last she was withdrew the syringe and straightened herself up. The girl turned with a start. One could see that, for all the lupus and the purple eyes, she was uncommonly pretty. Henry, her smile flashed readily at him, a row of coral teeth. Charming, charming, murmured the director, and... 
giving her two or three little pats, received in exchange a rather deferential smile for himself. "'What are you giving them?' asked Mr. Foster, making his tone very professional. "'Oh, the usual typhoid and sleeping sickness. "'Tropical workers start being inoculated at meter 150,' Mr. Foster explained to the students. "'The embryos still have gills. "'We immunize the fish against the future man's disease.'" We immunize the fish against the future man's diseases. Then, turning back to Lenina, 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 10 to 5 on the roof this afternoon, he said, as usual. Charming, said the director once more, and, with a final pat, moved away after the others. On rack 10, rows of next-generation's chemical workers were being trained in the toleration of lead, caustic soda, tar, chlorine. The first batch of 250 embryonic rocket plane engineers were just passing the 1,100-meter mark, mark on rack 3. A special mechanism kept their containers in constant rotation. To improve their sense of balance, Mr. Foster explained, doing repairs on the outside of a rocket in midair is a ticklish job. We slacken off the circulation when they're right, right, when they're right way up so they're half starved and double the flow of the surrogate when they're upside down. They learn to associate topsy-turvydom with well-being. In fact, they're only truly happy when they're standing on their heads. And now, Mr. Foster went on, I'd like to show you some very interesting conditioning. For Alpha Plus intellectuals, we have a big batch of them on rock, Rack 5. First gallery level. He called on two boys who had started to go down to the ground floor. is page 18. They're round about meter 900, he explained. You can't really do any useful conditioning till the fetuses have lost their tails. Follow me. But the director had looked at his watch. Ten to three, he said. No time for intellectual embryos, I'm afraid. We must go up to the nurseries before the children have finished their afternoon sleep. Mr. Foster was disappointed. At least one glance at the decanting room, he pleaded. Very well, then. The director smiled indulgently. Just one glance.